So you brought a few watches uh, here today, and uh, I know some are not from your personal collection. I think people one, have this. One is from my personal one collection. Is. Okay. Um, let's just go through it really quickly, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. Can, can, you I, wanna pick, like... can I pick which one is from your personal collection? <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's this, because this, oh, this is so you, right? It, I love wearing that, but it's, that's not from my personal collection. But I have worn this out like to the park. And what is this? Um, it's a day chest with a sort of like a unique band called a masterpiece band with this with the really kind of interesting gradiated bezel that goes from blue to yellow and with sort of kind of green stones in it too. This kind of stuff for me is fun because it, it's much different than uh, than sort of like the regular kind of sport models that I deal with. So anything with sort of with stones or anything kind of with diamonds I've always loved mm -hmm. and um, and they kind of got popular. In the last few years, I call it like the Gucciification of fashion, where I think everything was sort of very kind of gray and black and white, and then sort of like um, like street style kind of like hit fashion, and then like you know just became kind of wild, and uh, and I think it became culturally acceptable to wear these kind of like fun things. What, um, which which watch set it off? Was it like the the Rainbow Daytona? Um, I think that was part of it. Yeah, um, the Rainbow Daytona, the Diamond Dial Daytona. Um, for me, the first watch that I really got excited about that was kind of like funky was like the Zebra. Um, no, it was a cheetah, zebra. Right? No, there's a Zebra Datejust. Oh, okay, it has like it's black and white. And then two, the the Daytona, the Leopard Daytona too. That for me, when I saw that watch for the first time, I thought it was so insanely intense and funky that I loved it. I had I had one for a while and I would wear it around sometimes because it just like it made me really happy. But then now it actually got kind of popular. So you you gave me the little kind of backstory of that watch. Can you do you mind sharing that again? Oh the Leopard Daytona? The Leopard Daytona. Because I think that is the most anti Rolex modern Rolex watch. Oh back yeah. Then. So I think the the rumor is the CEO of Rolex at the mm -hmm. time. Um, had a girlfriend who wanted to wear something like that. Allegedly. Allegedly. And so he couldn't create a one-off, um, he couldn't cr create like a one-off watch. So then he put the, the actual watch into production and it was so like funky and, and, and no one liked them. And what, were they, what was the, the retail for? I think the retail towards the end of production was like in the $80,000 range. And then, but the watches in the secondary market were trading for like the low 30s because they were so unpopular. I but Nicholas Cage had one. Nicholas Cage had one. The guy from Aerosmith had one. Um, what Elton John. Is. Elton John had one. Yeah. You know, like it was just like, but for the few people that kind of like didn't care what people thought of them, you know, like and just wanted to wear whatever the fuck they wanted. That's that obviously was, you. That was me, <laughs> obviously. And then th that kind of stuff for me resonates because I think that when collecting in general is for me is like a very personal thing. It shouldn't be what other people are wearing. It should be like what you find exciting and interesting. And so that was always like a like a Leopard Daytona and all these kind of like funky colored watches are for me are really fun. So how does that adage translate to vintage once it, uh, vintage Rolex like Everyone's think, talking about oh you know Paul Newman's five five one twos like what what's the advice to the person that's maybe onto their second third watch or maybe this is their first vintage Rolex watch? Um, you know like I think that vintage Rolex is my first love and I think that I love the way that it fits in your life. I think because you could actually wear it and enjoy it. And you can bang it up and you can move a package and you can hit it on a railing and then nothing's going to happen to it. Right. So I think in essence. Like the the utility of it sort of made it easy to wear, and then the complexity of it because there were so many different dial variations and so many different kind of like things that they changed around with the watches. Like for example, there's a four year period where there's six different red subs, and you're wearing a red sub, I'm wearing a red sub, and and just that kind of like the the different variations made it fun. If they made one watch consistent for yeah. 20 years and it was the same watch, no one would collect it. Right. It's it's the sort of like the idiosyncrasies of having like all the little different kind of things that were changed all the time. And I think that even when they were doing it, I don't think that they were thinking that it was going to be a significant thing in the future. I think it was a run of production that they used up the dials and then they created the second series just because they were updating it. And along the way, they just, you know, it, it, all of a sudden they look back and there's like so much variation. And the further back you go, the bigger the variation becomes because the dials that they were using and the models that they were putting them into um, had a lot more variation. Well, now everything is much more consistent. Like a watch is a very specific dial with small nuance changes along the way, but it's but the runs are longer and it's sort of looks the same. So, 
Is there a specific era of watches or for all these vintage Rolex that you gravitate towards? Yeah, so I really, I really like the early 60s, um, from like 60 to 65. Gilt, gilt watches. Okay. Um, I love things with chaptering dials. For me, um, things with crown guards mean a lot more than no crown guard watches. I just, I like the design with them protecting what do we have the here? 5512? Yeah, 5512 underline from 63. Okay. So, um, like something like this is a lot more significant to me than like a big crown. Just because for me, what I think of like, what I think of like a car, what I think of a, like you could, you could use a car as a reference. So okay. like when I see a Model T, I don't get excited about it. You know, when I see like a, like a 60s like car, like a Ferrari or, or like, I don't know, like that kind of stuff is exciting because that shape means something to me. It's like You've exciting. Seen the evolution. You don't want to go start from the, the right the, in the beginning. Yeah, the first like. one isn't always the exciting one. Right. There's a, there Just has like to. the firstborn is not always the perfect one. Perhaps. In most <laughs> cases, they are the most perfect one because they get the most love. Uh, 5512, uh, what else is Guild Era? This one does have, It's a Guild Era. It, yeah. is, it is a small crown. We brought it out because of, of two things. One. It's interesting because not so much the, of the shape, and, but it's sort of like how it aged. And, and this watch, the dial turned like a really intense, beautiful brown tone, um, which is hard to see here, but like really, really obvious in sunlight. And you know, just because a tropical watch is tropical, um, I think people get the misnomer. They, they don't understand the variance in, in pricing, right? It's, um, this is something that takes a bit of an eye and a bit of taste to appreciate. Yeah, well, I think it's a combination of age but also the common in terms of color, but it also, the you don't want it to be damaged because there's a fine line between like something that is broken and water damaged and cracked and destroyed, which for everyone is, it's different. So right. I like things that are a lot more distressed than like the regular person, but I think the classic, the really expensive tropical watches, the tonal change in color is, is really, really stark and really like intense, I should say. And then the, the sort of like the finish of the watches, they haven't cracked, they haven't fallen apart. Um, and, and, and only a handful of pieces of age like that. Majority of things have sort of like it's gone and it's, it's like the more brown it turns, the more kind of damage it becomes. Right. So, so there's, a, there's a balance of trying to f find out what is really what appeals to you. And that's kind of fun because some people really like the stressed, crazy watches and other people want them to be perfect and they don't want any age. So, you know, there's something for everybody, which that's what makes it interesting. It's funny that most of these are uh, Gilt Era uh, watches. You have that Explorer on there as well? Yeah, I have a, a nice 1016. This is sort of like the other end of the spectrum where the tone is still very black um, and the dial hasn't really aged at all, but yeah. that's what makes it really beautiful too, so. And it's like a perfect mirror gloss. Yeah, perfect gloss which is a big kind of word that people, you know, like use in kind of describing kind of like vintage watches, especially gilt era ones where there's a clear coat of lacquer on top of the dial that sort of like gives it like a reflection, like a mirror reflection. But it also makes it very prone to any sort of imperfection because it is a mirror finish, right? Yeah. What I think that people don't understand that the reason a lot of times the top coat cracks is because the bottom paint coat has a different elasticity. So with different temperature fluctuations, the two like sections will come like, like they'll move around a little bit. And so the top clear coat is usually more brittle and it cracks and shears and breaks off while the, the tone underneath or the black paint underneath remains. Exactly. It doesn't, doesn't really kind of move around. Science. Um, science. <laughs> There's a lot of science to this. So we're not going to go into that, but I think that that's what kind of makes it interesting, you know, like different materials, like for example, radium watches, this kind of stop they started kind of not making, using as much radium right. in the 60s. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 63, they stopped make, using radium as in dial production, but they still printed the dials having like Swiss only on the bottom. Right. But then they put a little underline on. So like th to show that there was like a change in sort of like the materials that they were using for the luminescence. But I think that's, that's what makes it culturally cool, right? I mean, if it just had to underline for the sake of it being underlined, I don't think there would be as deep of a understanding or desire to understand yeah. the, these things. You're almost a, a historian or archeologist in terms of trying to under, understand why things are or came the way they, they did. And I think it's important to sort of like look at watches and sort of like the context of the time that they were produced in. Mm -hmm. Like Rolex was a company that was very pragmatic. 
and you know, even though they had these blank dials printed and they still didn't apply the luminous material, they didn't throw them away. They were like, we're gonna use these, we're just gonna change the material and they had, like put a coating on it, like a code for ourselves to know that these are the current production versions that we could put into watches, which makes it really cool. You know, if they just, if they, they threw them away and started from scratch, you wouldn't have these like really interesting transitions that they have, right. so it's, it's awesome. And uh, a Daytona. Uh, is in the mix here. What do we have here? Um, so it's a 626.5. You know, and t for me also, you know, like in terms of Daytonas, the early ones don't mean as much as the later series screw down kind of watches. I think mm -hmm. for, for, one, for one, you could actually get them wet without really kind of really stressing out about that. Um, and because of the bigger um, crown for the, for the stopwatch portion of the watch, the um, the watch feels bigger and more balanced, while the smaller kind of like just push button chronos um, that have aren't screwed profile. on, they just yeah. have a smaller profile. They don't feel um, the way that the 6265s and 6263s feel like. So um, Daytona's for me, it's like a funny story. Like I never collected any in my personal collection because the biggest kind of, and these weren't, you know, they were always more expensive than subs and GMTs. Sure. But the thing that always bothered me about them is like I would always, because I wouldn't wear a manual wind watch a lot. When you wear it and it stops, you look down at your watch and it's like, you don't know what time it is. You gotta like take it off and, and kind of fiddle with it. And so that's why like for me, like automatic watches are so great. You put them on and you wear them and you just wear them. You take them off at night and you maybe, and then you put them on in the morning and they just kind of work and they kind of work with your life, so. So the last watch that we're visiting, uh, it must be your personal watch. Um, well, this is, this is a funny story. This is the first watch that I bought to um, hold and collect and not because I, I honestly, I didn't even want it. I liked it and, but my wife wanted it, so. Current, well, she was my girlfriend before, but she wanted to have like a nice watch to wear. So I bought it and it sort of like was one of the first pieces that I bought to sort of like hold and keep away and not sell. Because back in the day, especially when we were starting out, everything, all of the watches that we got, we kind of had to sell to keep buying the next one, the next one, the next one. Right. So there was never like in a moment really to kind of like feel and hold like, it. like this isn't my watch. It right. always felt like it was like a, you know, like a catch and release kind of thing. Sure. So. What, what, what specifically did you like about this 1675? Um, I think initially, the, it was sort of, because I told her the story about the radial dial and how the plots were a little bit smaller, mm -hmm. and she just aesthetically liked it, and it was, um, the watch was unpolished, and we were at a watch show in Los Angeles, and another dealer, a friend of mine had it, and we just bought it, and I gave it to her as like a sort of like a gift, and it's always been something that she's had for the last, like maybe like, I think eight years or more at this point. So nice. it's kind of a cool story. Um, I feel like there's always a saying, like, you know, I think collectors and dealers, and I think the difference, the joke back in the day was, you know, like as a dealer, you don't fall in love. And like <laughs> collectors kind of fall in love with stuff and hold things. Um, but, uh, but if you're starting out, you kind of have to like keep buying and selling. You catch can't and release. Really, you yeah. can't really hold it. No, that makes sense. Do you have any memorable experiences hunting these watches? Yeah, you know, like I think a lot of it is it's you know the the process is 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 not as exciting as I think like people think. You're sitting in the computer and then you can email with some photos and it starts a conversation. So and sometimes the watches are in far away, distant places. And the nice thing about doing it for a long time, you have a big enough reputation that people will trust that you can send them a label and they'll sell them the watch before you pay them. Um, a funny story, like you, you asked me about a watch we had a long time ago, like an underline dial. So that person first started with a, sto with a story, like my name is so-and-so and, -so and I'm, I'm, I've had this watch when I was a Navy diver um, in the 60s and I'd like to sell it. And then he also offered us a lot of like, like he was a, a commercial diver and later and he recovered stuff from shipwrecks and he wanted to give us like sell us pieces from like the ships, mm -hmm. um, which we never bought. But the, the, he was too nervous about sending it to, um, to the States because he lived now in France. And then he took a train from France and London and met another dealer friend of ours and sat in his office. And then, so the dealer friend said, okay, the watch is here. And so our friend in London sent him a wire and he had to stay in his office for like an hour before his bank. Hit it, and, yeah. then, and, then, uh, and then he took the boat back home to, uh, 
back to Normandy, but you know, there's, there's kind of stuff like that, you know, that happens along the way. Um, there, I, when, I was, when I was younger, when I started doing this in the beginning, I would travel to meet people. Um, I've been to like South America, I've been to like random airports in the, in the middle of the United States. Like Lancaster, <laughs> California? I don't know. No, but like, like random, yeah. random places where there was like the, the, I would land, rent a car, drive to some person's house and hang out with them for like an afternoon. They showed me photos of, you know, what they did with the watch and stuff like that. Stuff like that. Were was you like, ever, ever nervous about it or was it? Uh, it didn't feel nervous because I think that these people were so excited to share the stories and they legitimately had the watches and then just like did stuff with them that it, I never felt like really nervous. Um, Cause there was never, because it was a, never a surprise, you know? They were expecting me and I was expecting them to have a certain thing that they really kind of showed me. But it was, some of the pleasant surprises were sitting with people, like sometimes older people would like ask me to have lunch with them. And we talk and hang out and like they show me photos and all of a sudden they're showing me photos of like Steve McQueen and them hanging out because they used to race like minis in like, you know, like in LA or something and they were mm -hmm. friends. You know, stuff like that um, would happen. Um, other times I would like travel somewhere and like pick up like there was some I remember one time I had like a um, like a like a bought a watch that was a double red sea dweller from a special forces guy and uh, and I handed him an envelope of cash and I was like hey do you want to count the cash and he looks at me he's like no man I'll find you if it's not right <laughs> and I was like oh that's great <laughs> so. <laughs> and you gave him an extra hundred bucks like I, I, just in case in case I'm short. <laughs> <laughs> and my shoes. So, um, but I remember like back then, um, you know, I, I was working corporate, but you would take these flights to Hong Kong and spend like 24 hours there and come right back. Yeah, there was moments where I would like go on these like insane trips, but they were like, they were pre-planned. So it wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't dropped somewhere and say, go find watches. It was sort of like, I had like a task. A like a, yeah. I was in Australia or I was in Hong Kong and I was like, and I didn't even know Hong Kong. I remember, if, you know, like it was exciting because I was in a place that I could kind of explore too, and it was like really, really fun because it wasn't just going to pick up a watch right. somewhere. It was going to pick up a watch in Hong Kong, and then going to like you know like try some food and like walking around, and it was like it was just like really exciting. So that's the part of the reason why I love this is like not just this is great. I love watches; they're my like love, and but it's also been the experiences and the people around them. And two, even you're, you're me talk, talking about me. Mostly, mostly yeah. you, and and and, uh, but like the fun, the fun thing has just been like meeting all these really, really interesting people that just kind of share a hobby with you and slipping in their lives. Maybe like sometimes very quickly to buy something from themselves from them, or you know, a lot of my really good friends, you know, that I have now are I've met through collecting watches. You know, so it's been it's a really great journey. So, well. Thank you so much for sharing this uh, information with us. I appreciate most of it. Can't say I appreciate all of it, but uh, fair I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll be talking again. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.